Hello and welcome to the first episode of Dragon Age Origins Codex video. So in each um, each video I make, I'm going to add an addendum video to it um, to basically just read all the codex entries that we discovered in that one video. So here we go with the codex entries from video one. All right. So we have creatures 21. Creature 21 is a rage demon. Encountered in the Fade, the true form of a rage demon is a frightening sight, a thing of pure fire, its body seemingly made of amorphous lava, and its eyes two pinpricks of baleful light radiating from its core. The abilities of such a demon center on the fire it generates. It burns those who come near, and the most powerful of its kind are able to lash out with bolts of fire and even firestorms that can affect entire areas. Fortunately, even powerful rage demons are less intelligent than most other varieties. Their tactics are simple. Attack an enemy on sight with as much force as possible until it perishes. Some rage demons carry over their heat-based abilities into possessed, ho possessed hosts, but otherwise the true form is mostly seen outside of the Fade when it's specifically summoned by a mage to do his bidding. So the rage demon was that fire guy that we fought in the Fade at the last um, battle in the Fade, which caught us on fire. <laughs> okay, so next is the sloth demon. And I looked at the creature, and it had become me, a veritable copy of my form, of my very mind, stared back at me as if from within a mirror. I thought surely this was a trick, an illusion meant to put me off guard. But as I engaged the thing, as I engaged the thing with my sword, it fought me with maneuvers that I recognized. It parried as I parried. It swung as I swung. It spoke to me and said things that only I could know. I, I think this demon of sloth has no former identity of its own. It is envy as much as sloth, I believe, and mine was not the first shape it stole that day. And that was an excerpt from a transcribed deposition of Tyrannus, a Templar commander of Cumberland, 390 Towers. So when they say 390 Towers, that's a date, pretty much. So I think it's three... The first number, I believe, is the age that it's in. So each age or each um well time i guess is measured here in ages and i can't remember exactly what makes an age like what what starts a new age i have the like dragon age encyclopedia thing the world of thetis but i can't exactly remember but i know that it means that the third age is called Towers, so it's three, and then it's the 90th year within that age. So it's in the third age, and the 90th year of that age, and that age is called Towers. And right now we're currently in the Dragon Age, which is why the game is called what it is. <laughs> Alright, the most difficult assumption for some who study demons to overcome is the notion that a sloth demon is, in and of itself, slothful. If that were so, it seems highly unlikely that any such demons would cross the veil into our own world, or once here would fight to possess any creature with a will of its own, and we know both these things to not be the case. Certainly some demons are lazy and complacent, but who knows, perhaps these creatures even cultivate such a reputation. The truth is that demons of sloth are named so because this is the portion of the human psyche that they feed upon, doubt, apathy, entropy. They seek to spread these things. The sloth demon hides in its forms, a master of shapes and disguises, always in the last place you look, and from its hiding place, it spreads its influence. A community afflicted by a, a demon of sloth could soon become a dilapidated pit where injustices are allowed to pass without comment, and none of the residents could be aware that such a change has even taken place. The sloth demon weakens, tires, um tears at the edges of conspicu or of consciousness and would much rather tender its sorry let me start this sentence again the sloth demon weakens tires tears at the edges of consciousness and would much rather render its victim helpless than engage in a true conflict such creatures are best faced only with a great deal of will and only with an eye to piercing their many disguises so the sloth demon was the bear that we talked to in the fade all right, let's go to 31, Wisp. 
A great deal is made of the most powerful demons, those that create abominations and those that have changed the history of Thetis. It is often forgotten that not all demons are such awe-inspiring um, beings. Some that break through the cracks in the veil into our world are known as wisps, a sliver of thought that once was. A wisp is a demon that has lost its power. Either it has existed in our world for too long without finding a true host, or it has been destroyed. Often, so we found, by other demons. What remains of its mind clings tightly to one concept that it created, that created it, a hatred of all things living. While its ability to target a living creature is limited, these wisps often mindlessly attack when encountered in the Fade. In the living world, they often have been known to maliciously lure, living, lure the living into dangerous areas, being mistaken for lanterns or other civilized light sources. This does, however, seem to be the very limit of their cunning. And this is from the journal of former senior enchanter Malius, one of the Circle of Ravain, declared apostate in 920 Dragon Age. So, um, the Circle of Ravain, Ravain is another country in Thetis. Um, right now we're in Ferelden, Ravain is another country. Um, so he, this is the senior enchanter, like, We've been speaking to a few senior enchanters at our circle. He was the senior enchanter at the one in Ravain. And he is now an apostate, which we have learned is a mage basically on the run, not a part of the circle. So he's now on the run in 920 Dragon Age. So the Dragon Age is the ninth age. As we saw earlier, um, the Towers Age was the third age. And he became an apostate in the 20th year of the Ninth Age, which is the Dragon Age. I hope that makes sense. So these wisps that he's talking about were those little light guys that we were fighting in the Fade. All right, wolf. It is rather unfair, the reputation that the wolf possesses in Ferelden. For a people that so clearly adore their hounds, Ferelden simultaneously harbor a distrust of wolves that borders on the unreasonable. Unreasonable, that is, if one were not familiar with the ancient legends regarding werewolves. There was a time in Ferelden's past when demons inhabited the bodies of wolves in great numbers, causing the wars against werewolves and spreading great fear and panic. The werewolves were slain, but even today the noble wolf is still looked upon with distrust. And this is from Legends of Ferelden by Mother Aeolus of Denerim, 920, or 910 Dragon. An attack by wolves upon civilized folks happens rarely, often only in times of desperation, and even then, only when the wolves have the advantage of numbers. This can change during a blight. When darkspawn rise to the, onto the surface, their presence dramatically alters the savage nature of normal beasts. In blights past, as the corruption of the darkspawn spread through the wilder uh, areas of Thetis, it would infect the animals found there and the more powerful of them would survive and be transformed into a more vicious and dangerous beast. A blight wolf is one such example, mad with the pain of its infection, and only through the overriding command of the darkspawn does it still retain some semblance of its pack instincts. Blight wolves are always found in large groups and will tend to overwhelm a single target if they can, using their numbers to their advantage. It is fortunate that these creatures rarely survive their corruption for very long. So, uh, we fought a spirit wolf in the Fade. We fought a few spirit wolves in the Fade. And this is talking about wolves kind of in general, not just spirit wolves, and how the Darkspawn and the, the Darkspawn, which Duncan told us about, and we'll also probably read a codex entry about, um, they can come up during the blight, during a blight, and influence wolves in a different way. All right, so that's all for the creatures. Let's go into magic and religion, which we have a lot about. So let's start with the Black City. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible. Always far off, for it seems that the only rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. The chant teaches that the Black City was once the seat of the Maker, from whence he ruled the Fade, left empty when men turned away from him. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. 
It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black, which was perhaps the least of their worries. And that's from Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons by Enchanter Mirdramel. So when we were in the Fade and we looked off into the distance, we could see like little floating cities off in the distance. I think that was probably the Black City. So the religion here in Thetis, um, they believe that that used to be the home of the maker or God. Um, and when magisters, when mages from the Tevinter Imperium, which is another country here in Thetis, um, when they figured out a way to get into the Black City, or the Golden City, which it was originally, when they figured out a way to get in there, it turned the city black, and the Maker left, and defiled everything. So, if you want to equate it to, like, Christian religion, I think it's kind of like when God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit, and Eve ate the fruit, and then everything was ruined from there. <laughs> All right, let's see. The Chant of Light. So this is the Chant of Light about the Blight. The Chant of Light, again, is like the word, like the Bible, I think, is the chant. Like the word of God. The word of the Maker. No matter their power, their triumphs, the mage lords of Tevinter were men and doomed to die. Then a voice whispered within their hearts, Shall you surrender your power to time, to time like the beasts of the fields? You are the lords of the earth. Go forth to claim the empty throne of heaven and be gods. In secret they worked, magic upon magic, all their power and all their vanity. They turned against the veil until at last it gave away. Above them a river of light, before them the throne of heaven waiting. Beneath their feet the footprints of the maker, and all around them echoed a vast silence. But when they took a single step toward the empty throne, a great voice cried out, shaking the very foundations of heaven and earth. And so is the golden city blackened with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven and doom upon all the world. Violently were they cast down, for no mortal may walk bodily in the realm of dreams, bearing the mark of their crime, bodies so maimed and distorted that none should see them and know them for men. Deep into the earth they fled away from the light. In darkness eternal they searched for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer, the sleeping dragon Dumont. Their taint twisted even the false god, and the whisperer awoke, awoke at last, in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all the nations of the world. The First Blight. From Threnody's Eight. So... This basically is like um, the biblical or the chant that describes what I just said about the Black City, where the evil magister lords <laughs> um, broke through the veil and entered heaven and blackened it, and they were cursed and cast down and became distorted and maimed, and they're no longer men. They are now darkspawn, and they were sent down under the earth they had to flee away from the light and they found their god dumat the false god the dragon the dragon dumat and then they followed that dragon and wreaked havoc upon all the world and that was what the first blight was all right here's a little bit about the maker or their god there was no word for heaven or for earth for sea or sky all that existed was silence. Then the voice of the Maker rang out the first word, and his word became all that might be, dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities, and from it made his firstborn. And he said to them, In my image I forge you, to you I give dominion over all that exists. By your will may all things be done. Then in the center of heaven he called forth a city with towers of gold, streets with music for cobblestones, and banners which flew without wind. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before the golden throne and sang hymns of praise unending. 
but their songs were the songs of the cobblestones. They shone with the golden light reflected from the maker's throne. They held forth the banners that flew their, flew on their own. And the voice of the maker shook the fade, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will are th all things are done, yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. And he knew he had wrought amiss. So the maker turned from his firstborn and took, the, took from the fade a measure of its living flesh and placed it apart from the spirits and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light, and my will alone is balanced, sundered, and the world given new life. And no longer was it formless, ever-changing, but held fast, immutable. With words for heaven and for earth, sea and sky, at last did the maker from the living world make men, immutable, as the substance of the earth, with souls made of dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. Then the maker said, To you, my second-born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. From the fade I crafted you, and to the fade you shall return, each night in dreams, that you may always remember me. And then the maker sealed the gates of the golden city, and there he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. And that's from Threnodies 5, 1 to 8. So that again tells a story about how the maker created, I guess like the fade, he created the fade and the spirits in his own city and he let, he watched and they didn't do anything. So he created like the real world, <laughs> not the fade, and created humans and pretty much left them to just see what happens while he watched from his golden city. Alright, so here's the fraternity of enchanters. So we talked to one of the senior enchanters and one of the mages about the f different fraternities. Um, so here we go. Another aspect of circle life is the fraternity. When a mage becomes an enchanter, he may ally himself with a fraternity. These are cliques that cross circle boundaries. Mages of common interests and goals who band together to ensure that their voice is heard within the College of Magi in Cumberland. The largest fraternities currently are the Loyalists, who act, advocate loyalty and obedience to the Chantry, the Equitarians, who advocate temperance and follow a distinct code of conduct which they believe all mages should hold themselves to, the Libertarians, a growing fraternity, publicly maintaining greater power for the circles, but secretly advocating a complete split from the Chantry, a dangerous opinion, naturally. The Isolationists, a small group that advocates withdrawing to remote territories in order to avoid conflicts with the general populace. And the Leucrosians, who maintain that the circle must do what is profitable first and foremost. They prioritize the accumulation of wealth with the gaining of political influence a close second. So far, an alliance between the Loyalists and Equitarians has prevented the Libertarians from gaining much headway, but there are signs that the Equitarians may throw their support in with the Libertarians. If that happens, many mages predict it will come to civil war among the circles. And this is from The Circle of Magi, A History, by First Enchanter Josephus. So that pretty much tells the same thing that um, that senior enchanter told us. He said that most of the senior enchanters at our circle are Equitarians, except for one who is a Libertarian. All right, hierarchy of the circle. It is no simple matter safeguarding ordinary men from mages and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measure of self-government, for it is ever the maker's will that men be given the power to take responsibility for our own actions, to sin and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory on our own strength. You who will be basked with the protection of the circle must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course his circle will take. He will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages, and you will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are the enchanters. These are the teachers and mentors of the tower, and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the pulse of the circle, for the enchanters will always know what is happening among the children. 
All those who have passed their harrowing but have not taken apprentices are mages. This is where most trouble in a circle lies, in the idleness and inexperience of youth. The untested apprentices are the most numerous denizens of any tower, but they more often pose threats to themselves due to their lack of training than to anyone else. And this was written by Knight Commander Serene of the Chantry Templars in a letter to his successor. So our first enchanter is Irving, who is that old guy with crazy um, eye bags. <laughs> and he's the one who is kind of like our coach, and he talked to us. The senior enchanters, we've seen a couple of them, and um, one of them also told us that a lot of them have gone to Ostagar um, to help the king in this war that's coming. And then we have become a mage because we are no longer an apprentice. All right, history of the circle, another one. It is truth universal. It is a truth universally acknowledged that nothing is more successful at inspiring a person to mischief as being told not to do something. Unfortunately, the Chantry of the Divine Age had some trouble with obvious truths. Although it did not outlaw magic, quite the contrary, as the Chantry relied upon magic to kindle the eternal flame which burns in every brazier in every Chantry. It relegated mages to lighting candles and lamps, perhaps occasional dusting of rafters and eaves. I will give my readers a moment to contemplate how well such a role satisfied the mages of the time. Probably not much. It surprised absolutely no one when the mages of Val Royo, in protest, snuffed the sacred flames of the cathedral and barricaded themselves inside the choir loft. No one, that is, but Divine Ambrosia II, who was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march upon her own cathedral. Even, even her most devout Templars discouraged that idea. For twenty-one days, the fires remained unlit while negotiations were conducted, legend tells us, by shouting back and forth from the loft. The mages went cheerily into exile in a remote fortress outside of the capital, where they would be kept under the watchful eye of the Templars and a council of their own elder magi. Outside of, the, outside of normal society and outside of the Chantry, the mages would form their own closed society, the Circle, separated for the first time in human history. And this is from, from, from of, oh, this is from Of Fires, Circles, and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. So that tells us how the Circle was first made, that the mages originally were just kind of treated as fire lighters in the church, and eventually they separated themselves to create the circle. All right, the harrowing, which is the test that we went through um, to graduate from apprenticeship to mageship. <laughs> Among apprentices of the circle, nothing is regarded with more fear than the harrowing, Little is known about this rite of passage, and that alone would be cause for dread, but it is well understood that only those apprentices who pass this trial are ever seen again. They return as full members of the Circle of Magi. Of those who fail, nothing is known. Perhaps they are sent away in disgrace. Perhaps they are killed on the spot. I heard one patently ridiculous ar sorry, one patently ridiculous rumor among the Circle at Ravain which claimed that failed apprentices were transformed into pigs, fattened up, and served at dinner to the senior enchanters. But I could find no evidence that the Ravani Circle ate any particularly p particular quantity of pork. <laughs> uh, from In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, by Brother Jenna TV. Okay, so... Yeah, there's not much more to say about that. <laughs> All right, four schools of magic, creation. So we saw when we were leveling up our skills that there were different categories. Um, one of them was creation. This quotes the chant. It says, opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered and the world given new life. Threnody is 5-5. Five, five. The school of creation, sometimes called the school of nature, is the second of the schools of matter, of the of, sorry, the balancing force and complement of entropy. Creation magic manipulates natural forces, transforming what exists and bringing new things into being. Creation requires considerable finesse more than any other school and is therefore rarely mastered. 
Those mages who have made a serious study of creation are the highest in demand, useful in times of peace as well as war. From The Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. Okay, so that's one school of magic, which is to create things. Um, entropy is the next one. To you, my second born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all consuming and never satisfied. From Thernides 5 7. The second of the two schools of matter, entropy, is the opposing force of creation. So this is the opposite of the one we just learned about. For this reason, it is often called the school of negation. Nothing lives without death. Time inevitably brings t an end to all things in the material world, and yet this ending is the seed of a beginning. A river may flood its banks, causing havoc, but bring new life to its floodplain. The fire that burns a forest ushers in new growth. And so it is with entropic magic that we manipulate the forces of erosion, decay, and destruction to create anew. This is also from The Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. Alright, the next one is Primal. Those who oppose thee shall know the wrath of heaven. Field and forest shall burn. The seas shall rise and devour them. The wind shall tear their nations from the face of the earth. Fighting shall rain down from the sky. They shall cry out to their false gods and find silence. And Dross Day 719. Sometimes called the school of power, the primal school is the second of the schools of energy, balanced by spirit, and concerns the most viable and tangible forces of nature itself. This is the magic of war, fire, ice, and lightning, devastation. It is what the vast majority imagines when they hear the word magic. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. Okay, so this is, yeah, all the fire, ice, and lightning. Alright, and the last school of magic is spirit. And the voice of the maker shook the fade, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done, yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. Thernity is 5-4. The first of the two schools of energy, spirit, is opposed by the primal school. So this is the opposite. It is the school of mystery, the ephemeral school. This is the study of the invisible energies which surround us at all times, yet are outside of nature. It is from the fate itself that this magic draws its power. Students of this school cover everything from direct manipulation of mana and spell energies to the study and summoning of spirits themselves. By its nature, an esoteric school, as most others know virtually nothing about the Fade, studies of spirit magic are often misunderstood by the general populace, or even confused for blood magic, an unfortunate fate for a most useful branch of study. Alright, so that's all we have so far about magic and religion. Let's move on to culture and history. So let's start with the Grey Wardens, which is what Duncan is. Duncan, the guy who we escorted to his room. The first blight had already raged for 90 years. The world was in chaos. A god had risen, twisted and corrupted. The, remain, the remaining gods of Tevinter were silent, withdrawn. What writing we have recovered from those times is filled with despair, for everyone believed, from the greatest archons to the lowliest slaves, that the world was coming to an end. At Weishaupt Fortress in the desolate Anderfels, which is another country, a meeting transpired. Soldiers of the Imperium, which is another country, seasoned veterans who had known nothing in their entire lifetimes except hopeless war, came together. When they left Weishaupt, they had renounced their oaths to the Imperium. They were soldiers no longer. They were the Grey Wardens. The Wardens began an aggressive campaign against the Blight, striking back against the Darkspawn, reclaiming lands given up for lost. The Blight was far from over, but their victories brought notice, and soon they received aid from every nation in Thetis. They grew in number as well as reputation, finally in the year 992 of the Tevinter Imperium, upon the Silent Plains they met the Archdemon Dumont in battle. A third of the armies of northern Thetis were lost to the fighting, but Dumont fell, and the Darkspawn fled back underground. Even that was not the end. The Imperium once revered seven gods, Dumont, Zazakel, Toth, Andoral, Razakel, Luskin, Luskin, and Ur Urthemiel. Four have risen as archdemons. 
The Grey Wardens have kept watch through the ages, well aware that peace is fleeting, and that their war continues until the last of the dragon gods is gone. And that's from Ferelden Folklore and History by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. So, we know that four of these gods that the Imperium used to worship became archdemons, and Duncan told us that the archdemons are the ones who rally the hordes of Darkspawn to come to the surface. All right, Darkspawn. Those who had sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was what was golden and pure turned to black. Those who had once been mage lords, the brightest of their age, were no longer men but monsters. Threnody's twelve one. Sin was the midwife that ushered the Darkspawn into this world. The magisters fell from the golden city, and their fate encompassed all our worlds, for they were not alone. No one knows where the Darkspawn come from. A dark mockery of men, in the darkest places they thrive, growing in numbers as a plague of locusts will. In raids, they will often take captives, dragging their victims alive into the deep roads. But evidence suggests that these are eaten. Like spiders, it seems darkspawn prefer their food still breathing. Perhaps they are simply spawned by the darkness. Certainly we know that evil has no trouble perpetuating itself. The last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again at the heart of Tevinter, spreading south into Orlay, which is another country, and east into the Free Marches, which is another area of Thetis. The plague spread out as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly Tevinter and the Anderfels, they say Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands preying on outlying farmers and isolating villages, a constant threat. So the last blight was in the Age of Towers, which was quite a while ago, and um, it never really happened in, in Ferelden. It happened in other countries, but not here. All right, let's move on to characters. Duncan, who is the Grey Warden that we escorted to his room. Men and women from every race, warriors and mages, barbarians and kings, the Grey Warden sacrificed everything to stem the tide of darkness and prevailed. Like many others, Duncan gave up his family name when he joined the ranks of the Wardens, a symbolic gesture of cutting ties. He might, he might say this was a convenience in his case, however. His mother was from the Anderfels, which is another country, and his father from Tevinter, which is also another country. His childhood was spent in the Free Marches, which is a free area of Thetis, and Orlay, which is another country. <laughs> so he's from all over the place. His people were everywhere, and his homeland was nowhere. He was given the almost impossible task of leading the Wardens in Ferelden, a kingdom that had thrown the Order out 200 years earlier. Facing local suspicion and hostility, he set about finding recruits. So he's been recruited to lead the Ferelden Grey Wardens, of which there aren't any because um, they were forced out. But now uh, they're needed, and so he's recruiting people. All right, Knight Commander Gregor, who is the Templar in charge, who was arguing with Irving, the first enchanter. He's the one who told us magic should be used to help men and not against them. Um, yeah. He's the big head honcho. Your magic is a gift, but it's also a curse. The Circle of Magi has trained you, and we Templars of the Chantry stand vigil to ensure that training is adequate. Grim and taciturn, Gregor has been Knight Commander of the Templar forces stationed at the Circle Tower for so many years that hardly anyone except the First Enchanter recalls that he is not simply part of the Tower itself. All right, first enchanter Irving, who's the head mage, the one, the old guy with the bags under his eyes. That's first enchanter Irving. If you want to survive, you must learn the rules and realize that sometimes sacrifices are necessary. There's no higher office in a circle tower than that of the first enchanter. The one who holds this title must not only be an able administrator, but also a mentor, leader, and surrogate parent to all the mages of the tower. Irving has proven himself to be all of these things with an added dose of cunning. Most apprentices know that little goes on in the tower that Irving does not know. He can soothe Templars, angered by some childish magical prank, at the same time that he lauds the pranksters, and everyone walks away satisfied. 
All right, and we have some notes. These, this is Feast Day Gift Credits, which is a DLC, and this is More Credits, which is also a DLC. And then we have controls here as well, which probably you don't need to hear about. It just kind of tells you how to, um, yeah, use the controls, which if you're not playing the game, you don't need to know. So I think that's it for this first Codex video, and I hope that this will be worth it for you guys. I find all this lore stuff fascinating in Dragon Age. There's so much to it. The writers really built a full world that there's a lot to know about. So stay tuned for the next video, and thanks for watching. Bye.